Where are you from? Canada. No, nah, man. Where are you really from? <laughs> yeah, we all know it. St. Mike's Hospital, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, A. <laughs> Come on, man, you gotta help me out. Where are your parents from? <laughs> Korea. I knew it. I'm really good at that. I knew you weren't Chinese. I thought maybe Japanese, but no, you know, Korean drama, I love it. I eat kimchi too. <laughs> What's your real name? Wait, I gotta ask. North or South? Come on, man. <laughs> It doesn't matter where I go, what country I go to. It could be France, unfortunately. It could be Britain. It could be uh, Brazil. People don't accept the answer that I am Canadian. Uh, it doesn't get better when I go to uh, Korea, where I do look Korean. As soon as I open my mouth, however, uh, they think America. At home, I'd be eating kimchi and speaking Konglish, Korean English with my parents. And outside, I would be speaking uh, English with my friends and being the best banana I could be, which is yellow on the outside and white on the inside. <laughs> and I always had these struggles with my identity. I remember the day that it really hit me. I was walking um, next to a very reflective building with my friends. And I look over and I think, one of these things is not like the other. One of these things is not the same. And all my friends were white, and I wasn't. And it made me really question my identity. And the reason why this became such a, a problem for me was because if I didn't know who I was, I had a difficult time really believing that I knew what I wanted, or I knew what I believed in, or I knew what I identified in. If I can't even figure out what I am, how can I make the big choices in life? So I would lie in my bed, staring up at the ceiling, thinking, thinking for no real purpose, just thinking in circles, with no real satisfaction, just thinking about who I am. I thought so much I even named this term. I called it, and excuse the language, I called it mental masturbation. <laughs> it wouldn't be satisfying. I would just be thinking uh, consecutively, and then when I was done, I'd probably fall asleep, and then the next day I would do it again. <laughs> mental masturbation. This did not get better at the end of university. I was still thinking, uh, am I really making these choices for the right reasons? You know, I was a good Asian American. I thought, I'm gonna be a doctor, lawyer, and or engineer. This is where I'm supposed to be. Um, life is good, I had my you know, leadership positions. Everyone thought I had everything contro under control, but I really had no idea. And then divine intervention came. A friend of mine, Max, and his parents, Linda Schuyler, and, uh, Stephen Stone, who I will be forever indebted to, uh, came to me with the gift of travel. Uh, and for a poor immigrant, I thought that this was a really big opportunity for me to actually get out there and see the world. So we started doing our trip. We started traveling around. We did the standard Europe. Uh, we went to see way too many churches, way too many art galleries, uh, all those, you know, things that you could have Instagrammed, but Instagram did not exist then. And it was fun. We went over to Southeast Asia, and I had a very educational experience with a ladyboy. <laughs> same, same, but different. <laughs> went over to Australia, and after 10 months of travel, which is amazing, I said bye to my friends. And they went home, but I was compelled to keep on going. I had to keep on going. And it was because I was actually finally making decisions of my own. Poor decisions, but I was making decisions <laughs> of my own. I was learning about what I wanted, who I was, what I believed in, it was all coming together. And I had a fundamental belief that it's when you leave your friends, your family, the media, and everyone who tells you who you have to be, that's really when you're free to kind of figure out who you want to be. And it's when you leave your couch, your TV, your McDonald's, your Starbucks, your Wi-Fi, uh, and your language, that you're really free to figure out what you can really do. So I thought, I gotta keep on going. And I, I did my trip and I kept on traveling. So 10 months turned into 10 years. <laughs> and I did have my home bases, uh, but you know, I, I wasn't settled for a very long time. I kept on popping in and out, always going around. And uh, I kept traveling. I did the standard thing where I would, uh, you know, it was pretty ridiculous. I went to over 100 cities 
dozens of countries. I lived in a few cities as well. Um, but it wasn't enough. I thought, I need to learn more. So uh, you know, I thought, you know what I like? I like animals. If you, if you don't like animals, you can't be my friend. <laughs> um, I thought, I'm going to go around the world and see the most majestic animals, which looking back may not have been the most ethical choice. But I hugged tigers, I hugged lions, I hugged pandas, swam with whale sharks. Subsequently, I ate a lot of animals. Scorpion, I do not recommend, by the way. And then I thought, I like the human experience. I've got to learn more about the human experience. And I love culture, so if I learn more about other people, I'll learn more about myself, right? So I hit up all these festivals. I went to the world's largest food fight, the Tomatina, in Spain. I went to Songkran, the world's largest water fight. I would call them all the world's largest that would be there. There's even a wine fight for people who like wine. I went to a festival in Taiwan where I would be dancing on fireworks. And yes, you bleed. <laughs> Uh, you would also do those lantern uh, festivals, Holi in India, the color festival, and uh, Carnival in Brazil. I thought I was, it was basically a hedonistic trip, just figuring out culture. But it wasn't enough, so I thought, maybe I need a wider spectrum of the human experience. And some of it happened by accident, but I thought, what if I go to the more depressing side? I went to Haiti after the earthquake. I went to New Orleans after Katrina. Uh, I've been shot at, I've had a gun in my face, I've been drugged, homeless, robbed, I caught a thief <laughs> in a Mario suit for some reason. <laughs> Carnival, you gotta go. <laughs> uh, and I was a beggar on the streets as well. And although these horrible experiences were bad at the time, they did teach me a lot. But for some reason, it still wasn't al enough. And just like I was taught as a child, as many other people were taught, that I was a special unicorn and my dreams meant everything, I thought, you know what, I'm gonna go for my dream. I'm gonna do what I always wanted, no matter how unreasonable it is. And I grew up on a video game called, video game called Street Fighter. So I thought, I'm gonna go around the world and I am gonna fight everyone. <laughs> I documented it, I called it my level up trip, and I did ridiculousness. I did a marathon on every continent. Uh, Antarctica was a lot warmer than you would expect. Uh, I, I lived in 12 different countries where I did martial arts and I lived in the Shaolin Temple. I did Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in uh, Copacabana. I, uh, where else? LA with Manny, um, for Freddie Roach, learning how to box. Uh, Spain, everywhere else, I would just go around the world fighting, just like I thought it was this amazing trip. And my life started turning out into a weird Facebook profile, <laughs> where basically, uh, it was just a series of cuddly animals, festivals, and running. <laughs> uh, lots of running, and a lot of jumping for some re weird reason. <laughs> uh, the police officers did stop, but it was just to take pictures. <laughs> and I came back with all these photos, all these experiences, a lot of participation ribbons and way too many t-shirts from runs. And I still felt the same. I didn't really learn much about myself. I just felt older. I wasn't old, but my friends were having babies and getting mortgages. Uh, I felt poor. I wasn't poor, poor, but I was in debt. I didn't have savings. And I felt alone. And when I say that, I don't mean like I was all lonely. I mean, you ever watch one of those TV shows where there's a group of friends and they have their adventures every single week? But once in a while, a guest star would show up and then you wouldn't see him for the next season. That's pretty much what I felt like, where I would be in and out, tell a cool story, and I'm gone. I didn't have my, my crew, my group of friends where I felt really, really close to. So basically I had passport stamps and stories. <laughs> so I was back to the start, lying in my bed, looking up at the ceiling, thinking. But this time I don't call it mental masturbation because I had a lot of material to think back on and really try to dissect my travels to find an answer. And that answer actually came really early on. Um, probably been the second year of my travels in North Korea. And it was one of those very vivid moments where I was going up the mountains in a bus. I was lis listening to this sh song by Nijabez called Mist Line. And it was just perfect because we were literally in this mist line. 
and it was raining, and the clouds are kind of around us, and I was looking at the window of the bus, and there were these water droplets on it. And thinking back, that's probably when it all hit me, and I figured it out. This whole idea of identity and problems and things that I was trying to figure out was all on this window. And I would look at one of these water droplets go across the window, and it would get thinner, and it would start stopping, and then eventually it would be gone. And that's how I was living my life. I was this solo raindrop kind of going around along until I was stopped. And when I think about those moments back in my trip where I felt really exuberant, where I felt really belonging, where I felt amazing, it was because I was like a different raindrop. When you look at another part of the bus, it was full of water, all these little raindrops all around it. And as this raindrop went down, it would collect from everything around it, gain speed, gain momentum, get bigger and fatter, and just kind of go all the way across. And when I thought about it, I felt like that was actually my identity. It wasn't so much, a, I guess, a place. It's not so much I'm Canadian anymore, I'm Korean anymore. It wasn't even the experiences themselves in my trip that were the teacher, it were all the people I was with. It was this group of ridiculous people trying to find themselves as I traveled around the world that really contributed to who I was. I have this passion from these fire performers, uh, <laughs> attention to detail from these crazy cosplayers that I would know, uh, competitiveness from the b-boys, and the runners I met on Antarctica were a total different level of insanity. <laughs> Some of them running hundreds of marathons every single year. I don't have a country, but I started to finally figure out kind of who I was. I kind of felt a belonging in a way. And that's where, that's what I try to teach the people that, you know, when they ask me, oh, what'd you learn from your travels? That's, that, that, this is the biggest lesson I learned from it, is that when I look back, it's all 2020. The four things I learned from this entire experience was, when I know what I, who I am, I know what I want. I know how to change myself. I know resilience, and I know belonging. It sounds simple in a way, but that's, that's what, all the 10 years kind of comes together too. And with those four things, I feel ready to take over the world. Knowing who I am, I kind of know what I want. Uh, there's a book called The Alchemist by Paulo Coelho. Oh, there you go. And he says that, you know, if you know your heart, you won't surprise yourself. I make horrible decisions, guys. Uh, the worst decisions make the best stories, but I make some bad decisions. And whenever I make that bad decision and something's gonna happen, I'm like, no, this is you. This, this is exactly what you would have done. You wouldn't have changed it ever. <laughs> I know what I want. And, you know, funny enough, I'm actually going back to medical school. Um, before, I was wondering if my parents were forcing me towards it. Now I realize it's actually what I wanted. I just lost 10 years. <laughs> it's okay. It's what I would have done. <laughs> I know what I want. <laughs> it's also good because I know how to change myself. And I'm not talking P90X and, you know, dieting and all that stuff. To influence yourself is really a lot easier than you would think. Just like that raindrop that was going down that window, you collect from people around you, which sounds pretty obvious. And if you surround yourself with haters and people who are negative, people that influence you in a poor way, you'll take it on. You'll start gossiping and you'll think more like them. Being inspired is, is not that difficult in a way. You just got to surround yourself with people like the people here or people that, you know, that would push you forward, make you a little uncomfortable. You surround yourself with these water drops and you will absorb some of it. You will also leave some of yourself behind and you'll change. If you hang out with just photographers, I swear you know photography terms. <laughs> it'll happen and it'll happen automatically. So I know what I want, I know how to change. And then the next one is really important to me is resilience. Dealing with stress is difficult. Uh, emotions are the only truth, I'm told. Uh, it's the only thing that'll make you quit a job or go and find yourself in some ashram in India. Uh, it's something that really affects you because when you get those feels, you gotta deal with them. Uh, recently, I went through a very uh, difficult time in my life where I lost somebody who was a very big part of my identity. And when you live with someone or when you are with somebody and you lose them, you might lose the memories, the times, and a huge chunk of who you think you are. And you might even not know who you are anymore. But if you're thinking that you are this water drop, 
It's not that bad to get back on your feet. You just got to surround yourself again with people who remind you who you really are. And that was really important to me. And sure, this part is gone, but it doesn't mean that you can fill in the blanks again and you know, become strong again as an identity. And identity is really what we're looking at when you look in the mirror and you think, that's who I am. And the last thing was belonging. And I, oh, I still get the questions, you know, where are you from? People still ask me about North Korea if I was born there. People still talk about K-pop and all that other stuff, but belonging to me is easy now, uh, was, which was the hardest question of my life. And it's just, when I look around, I see a collaboration of all the people that have made me who I am today, as ridiculous as they are, or as explosive like a fire performer. That's all a part of me now, and I know exactly where I belong. It's not a geographic location. We don't need identity as a geographic location anymore. It's easier when you're in Korea and let's say your five closest friends all eat kimchi and all speak Korean and all do the same things and all went to the same school. But in a multicultural environment where none of my closest friends speak the same language, identity is just this collaboration of everyone around you. And that's where I found my belonging. And I think that's the most important thing is to know where you belong. Thank you.